So we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Deanna Yuzarski. I am on the marketing communications team here at Insight Partners. And today I'm joined by Matt and Pablo. We're going to be going through five principles for growth in 2023. Now, before we get started, just a few housekeeping things. Oops, go back one slide. And yes, so the session is being recorded. So if you don't hear what we say, you need to leave partway through, whatever it may be, we will share the recording with you within a few days. So keep an eye out for that in your inbox. If you have any questions, please submit them into the Q&A. We'll be pausing throughout for questions. We really want to hear um, what you guys have to say, questions that you have. And um, so please don't be shy and send those over to us. Um, there will be a two-question survey following the webinar. So if you don't mind, it takes two seconds. We'd really love to get your feedback. Helps us deliver the best sessions to you guys moving forward. And very exciting, we will be giving away a, uh, 150 copies of What a Unicorn Knows, the book, which is um, what served as the foundation for what we're talking about today. So we'll be sharing a link. Stay tuned. And uh, the first 150 people to fill that out will get a copy of the book sent within a few weeks. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Pablo. Thanks, Deanna. Welcome, everybody. Uh, super excited to talk to you all today. Um, real quick before we get started. Um, for those of you that are not aware, um, I'm part of Insight Partners, as is Matt. Um, we are a B2B software uh, investor in uh, in growth companies. Little stats about us here in terms of uh, how long we've been operating over 25 years, about $90 billion assets under management. Um, so if you are a software company, um, definitely, uh, you know, definitely should be talking to the team here, but um, just to give you a sense of uh, who we're working with. So for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Pablo Dominguez. I am the operating partner at Insight responsible for supporting our portfolio companies from a sales and customer success perspective on the advisory team. Um, also co-author with Matt May. Matt, if you wanna introduce yourself. Sure, uh, Matt May. Uh, obviously I work with Pablo in the same center of excellence. Um, I guess the uh, relevant part of, of my background um, is that I got to spend the better part of uh, of 10 years with a company called Toyota that's often thought of as the birthplace for Lean. And I run something called the Lean Scale-Up Program at Insight Partners, which is a small suite of workshops, uh, which we're going to actually introduce you to today. Thanks, Matt. So we have three goals today. Um, since we are focusing on um, the five Lean principles, and we'll walk you those th through those in a second, given the current economic environment, really want to make sure that you guys walk away with what is our unicorn model on how to drive sustainable growth this year, but also in it basically every year? We're going to share some lessons uh, to make it applicable and real for you. And then we're actually going to show you how to apply those principles. So this is not intended to be an academic discussion where you're like, hey, I learned something interesting, but what do I do now? Um, you'll see that there are actually um, some templates that we'll provide uh, for you to actually walk away and actually start leveraging these principles. So let's get started. Um, again, if you have questions throughout, feel free to uh, type in the Q&A um, and we'll answer them as we go. And we'll also have time at the end to also ask additional questions. So Matt, over to you. All righty. Thank you, sir. All right. I want to take you back uh, a few decades to 1994. Uh, I live in Los Angeles. In 1994, I was awoken about 4.30 in the morning to the earth moving beneath me, and we had a massive earthquake. Um, it's called the Northridge earthquake. And before I go any further, I really should uh, point out that our hearts uh, go out to those uh, across the globe in Turkey and Syria who have are, are now undergoing uh, similar circumstances with massive loss of, uh, of life, limb, and property. But here in Los Angeles, several of the freeways were broken down. Um, in particular, one artery that goes from downtown Los Angeles to the beach, Santa Monica, which is responsible for, for basically transporting um, a large share of the downtown working population, over 350 cars, commuters per day. The bridge was broken down in an overpass, preventing that flow of traffic. The California Transportation Authority here in the state of California estimated that it would probably take a year and a half to get that freeway back up and running. Expected loss, combined economic impact of roughly $1 million a day. So that's lost productivity, that's cost to rebuild. 
Uh, a gentleman by the name of C.C. Myers, who is a bridge builder, um, focusing on emergency projects like these, beat a path to uh, the, the state government offices in Sacramento and said, that can't possibly be right. A year and a half, I can do this five times faster. Um, the governor at the time said, well, let's put your money where your mouth is. And they arrived at a contract, a little under $15 million contract. And the contract was to get that freeway up and running in 140 days. But there was a bit of a kicker to it. Um, C.C. Meyer is pretty bright. And he said, you know what? Give me $200,000 for every day I come in under 140 days. Governor was pretty smart too. And he said, fine but I'm gonna ding you $205,000 for every day that you are late. Quick comments um, in, in the Q&A or the chat, let us know how long you think it took CC Myers to get that freeway up and running, traffic flow restored. Any thoughts? I'm getting uh, 120, Matt, 110, 100. Uh, 37, very aspirational, 45. Uh, so all over the place, but most are coming in around, you know, a little less than 140, about 100 to 120. All right, here we go. You ready? 66 days. Original estimate, a year and a half. You can do that math in terms of number of days. 74 days early. C.C. Meyer, if you do the math uh, on, the, on the bonus, doubled his top line at the same time, saving the state of California over $500 million. So why did we tell that story? The reason we told that story is because the principles behind that allowed him to do that and have that kind of effect and impact um, are those that we're gonna share with you right now. We think they're enormously applicable to uh, business, especially the scale up community. Thanks, Matt. So um, how do we get here and why do we decide to write this book and share these principles? So Matt and I have been working together for a little over a decade, about 11 years. We've worked together at a public company, uh, leveraging these principles at a startup before I joined Insight for five years, also leveraging the principles and now working with our portfolio companies here at Insight, um, applying the principles. And most of Lean um, has been born in manufacturing and really applied, applied the product development but we've actually been applying it in the go-to-market world uh, across marketing, sales, post-sales. Um, and I think part of what you'll see today is the applicability of that across your business, whether you're a startup, a scale-up, um, or a public company, um, and how effective it can be to help you drive sustainable growth. So we decided to put those uh, principles in a book and share them with the community. And so we're excited to share those with you all here today. Matt? Okay. Um... I promise we're not going to regurgitate everything in the, in the book. What we really want to do is give you a taste test of uh, what's in that book and the principles and how we put them into play. As Pablo mentioned, we are operators. We are practitioners. We are not scholars. We're going to share with you foundational principles that um, you should be following this year, previous years, and years coming uh, you know, in the future. And we want to start with a big idea. Much of our work is centered on working with scale-ups. And if you're not familiar with that term, it's kind of the middle teenage years, um, you know, have start up, scale up, and then grown up. Um, we liken scale ups to a Formula One team and especially a Formula One car. And the reason for that is they're both high performance, they're high growth, they're high velocity. And one of the things that we want to communicate to you today is the notion of lean really being about working within constraints, using constraints to leverage our ability to create, to innovate, um, and how to understand the constraints that, that face us all. I'm sure we're all familiar with words from, you know, from seventh grade science, you know, drag, it's about air resistance, um, inertia, it's the, the ability to, uh, you know, change the state of motion, uh, friction, uh, parts rubbing against each other, and waste. These kinds of forces face you as an organization. And I don't think anyone that has worked in an organization um, is not familiar with these, right? Dragging means, gosh, decisions take so long. It takes so long for this initiative or this program to get off the ground. Inertia, well, gosh, we're, we're kind of stagnant. Uh, we used to be this lean, agile, you know, 
an entrepreneurial garage outfit. And all of a sudden now we've got all these hurdles and red tape we've got to go through. Friction, you know, appears, gosh, you know, with the customer experience. Um, and waste, gosh, waste is 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 the public enemy number one of lean. And when it comes to, you know, thinking about uh, your organization as a Formula One car, gosh, waste is, uh, uh, you know, Gosh, the, the the pit stop is probably the thing that we all love to watch when we watch Drive to Survive on Netflix. It's actually a form of waste, and we're going to get into that as we move forward. But how you think about these constraints really lands us on the doorstep of what we call the unicorn model, and it's five lean-based principles. And I want to emphasize the fact that, that lean, the way that we are using it, is um, at a foundational level, sort of a, a, a macro level, not lean with a, with a small L, but with a capital L. Lean meaning maximum effect through minimum means. And there are five principles, each one responding to one of the forces that I just mentioned. The first is strategic speed. Strategic speed answers the question, are, are you able to make decisive strategic, strategic moves swiftly? And it targets drag directly. The second one is constant experimentation. Um, this has to do with your, your pipeline, how robust it is. Are your, are your products constantly being refreshed and are they innovative? Accelerated value is all about that uh, the notion of friction, removing friction from the customer experience and making sure that value is delivered to a customer in the form that they are requesting and requiring as quickly as possible. Lean process is all about the effectiveness of your workflow. And all of those four principles come together and are glued together with a fifth principle that is less about an operating principle and more of an organizational or cultural principle, which is esprit de corps. And it really targets all four of those preceding principles. Five of anything is very difficult to remember. So an easy acronym here, we work with scale ups all the time, is scale, strategic speed, constant experimentation, accelerated value, lean process, and esprit de corps. And let me just say again, the aim here, the goal here of lean is how do you achieve the maximum effect through the minimum means just like C.C. Meyer did in reconstructing the Santa Monica Freeway. So I'm gonna go through these very quickly. Um, Pablo's gonna help me toward the latter part. So I'm gonna go through a couple. It's gonna seem like we're sipping from a fire hose, but that's why we have a book that you uh, have the opportunity to win. I'm gonna start with the S in scale, which is standing for strategic speed. We take a leaner view of strategy. Strategy to most people means strategic planning, a process, a plan. It takes weeks, it takes months, it takes a lot of negotiation. It's usually you know, captured in a thick document and for some reason it happens around the first of the year in January. We're here to tell you that the way that we think about strategy and strategy formulation is far leaner, it's far quicker, it's far more agile in its development and its deployment. We use a framework called playing to win. It is a, a integrated cascade of choices, numbering five, again, that you see in front of you. The choices are deceptively simple. What's our winning aspiration? Where will we play? How will we win? What critical capabilities do we need? And what management systems are required? What makes those choices difficult is that they all need to be integrated logically. At the heart of strategy is the duality of where to play and how to win. And as you see here from Michael Porter, sort of the grandfather of modern strategy, the essence of strategy is choosing what not to do. And that's in keeping with the whole lean mindset uh, in general. Remember, it's all about maximum effect through minimum means. The way that we actually deploy strategy once designed is using a tool. And I want to share that very quickly with you. We use a visual map that takes us through the design process all the way through to how are we going to deploy this in the market. It's a three-step process. I'm not going to go into much detail here. This is a visual map that we use both uh, in remote sessions and in person. We make our choices, we stand back, we ask what would have to be true for that to be a good set of choices. And then if any of those answers to the what must be true questions give us pause, we test them out. It's far more like product design than it is anything remotely related to strategic planning. It happens very fast. It happens over the course of a day. We do multiple teams. 
Um, and we walk away with a portfolio of strategies, stand back from that and decide which one makes the most sense to deploy. Uh, case in point, one of our portfolio companies was struggling to make a market move, wanted to own the mid-market. We gathered them for just a half a day. We emerged with a strategy that was so effective and really captured all of the, the collective wisdom of the group that that company went on to deploy the strategy and was acquired by a larger payment platform very successfully. A few checkpoints here, I'll turn this over to Pablo. Yeah, so things to keep in mind, and this is you know relative, important um, given what's going on in the environment. So we're, we're gonna basically have checkpoints for you for each of the principles to think about, right? So from a strategy perspective, really thinking about, are you really focused on where you should play or not play, right? And from a go-to-market perspective, that can mean a lot of things. Um, given limitations on capital, on growth, or other limitations, should I be rolling out every product that I thought I was going to roll out? Should I be going out into new markets? Should I be hiring at the level that I potentially was before, right? Um, second being, do all parts of the business have aligning strategies to the company strategy? So, do the different departments align overall to what the CEO uh, and the board want you to focus on, right? There's nothing worse than not being focused and aligned. Um, and third, um, are those strategies prioritized, right? In order to operationalize, or are you just going after everything um, that you guys have worked on as a team? Or have you said, hey, let's tackle number one first, then two, um, then three, then four. So just three things to keep in mind. There's obviously uh, additional elements, but wanted to make sure things to think about as you are reframing your strategy. One thing also that Matt uh, you know, usually touches on is strategy is not about strategic planning process, right? This is not the, hey, it's the end of the year, let's start budgeting, you know, what, what, what should the uh, you know, board plan be, et cetera. This is about constantly thinking throughout the year, are we doing the best things possible to grow as a business uh, and what trade-offs do we make to ensure that we can survive uh, and build a sustainable business? So just things to keep in mind um, as you think about strategy. Yeah, and on that note, um, I, I, I would venture to say that whatever strategy you are employing right now in the marketplace, there's a good bet that given the economic conditions and the macro climate, that the assumptions under which that strategy was formulated might not be as valid as they were when you formulated that strategy. And so you're constantly asking yourself, what must be true for the strategy to work? And that's when you know, when the, when the what must be true answers are no longer true, that is your signal to get back to strategy design. Done right, your strategy should be one page. You should be able to fit that on a page. And by the way, we're going to make all of the templates that you see uh, and the tools that we're going to share with you accessible uh, following this. Moving on to the next uh, part, the next principle, constant experimentation. Um, I want to make the point here that oftentimes we think that ideas are everything. And I think that Mark Randolph here makes the point quite well. It's really not about ideas. It's about what you do with those ideas and the experiments that you run to make a concept commercial. Um, there is absolutely nothing unique about an experiment that we're going to share with you. The challenge is in making sure that it's part of your daily work, part of your daily regimen. Um, oftentimes we see companies that uh, have great deal of success with an initial product and they ride that success. And as they grow and as they scale, they begin to add layers and they kind of take their eye off the ball um, from an innovation perspective. But the, the flywheel that you see here really begins with um, finding a fresh opportunity, whether that's a pain point that a customer has shared with you. Um, whether you have observed something in your user base, if you watch users use your product, that then um, uh, becomes and reframed as a, as a testable hypothesis, just like you did in science class when you were learning how to run experiments. If we do X, Y will happen Z percent of the time. That then allows you to run a business experiment. And a business experiment is a little bit different than a scientific experiment, even though it's a scientific method. A business experiment really needs to be simple, fast, frugal, repeatable, scalable, and focused on a business outcome, whether that's revenue, whether that's you know perhaps your NPS, uh, what have you. Um, and that experiment then would produce new insights, 
um, that feeds into a fresh opportunity. And this is something that is so powerful, this notion of constant experimentation as being the engine of innovation that in Formula One, they actually limit the amount of test time for experimentation um, that a team can have both off season and on season, because the more experimentation you do, the more innovation that uh, you can uh, produce and potentially have a competitive advantage. And so this is a competitive must. Um, and uh, that's basically the notion of, of, of constant experimentation. When it comes to CC Meyer, I want to connect the dot there on the, uh, on the freeway. Um, experiment, if you will. The entire thing was a bit of an experiment because they use different kinds of steel, lightweight steel, stronger, more tensile. Uh, they use quick set, uh, setting concrete and they experiment with all of those materials so they could help reduce that amount of time it took to construct things. So, checkpoints. Thanks, Matt. I, by the way, I always find it fascinating that <laughs> the F1 governing body tries to limit innovation, uh, which is extremely interesting, but um, makes sense from a competitive standpoint. So things to, to think about um, as you think about, are you experimenting within the organization and your organizations, right? One, does leadership favor experimentation, right? And to what extent is experimentation a part of your culture, one and two, um, and I'll touch on the third one. Do you have a common methodology for experimentation? So for example, um, some of the companies we've worked with both, you know, public and, um, here at Insight that are the best at this are exceptional at ensuring that before they roll something out, um, they're constantly testing it with customers. Maybe you're launching a new product rather than going live. You know, and I know product people call those MVPs, you know, you test it with a couple of customers first and quickly iterate, Right. From a go-to-market perspective, um, are you, you know, if you're making changes to something, do you deploy it first in a market, right? So maybe you deploy it in the UK first um, to see if that strategy works for you. Um, if you're changing quotas or comp plans to motivate your sales teams, maybe you do that first there. If you're uh, trying out a new brand strategy, right? You test that somewhere else first. So always think about how you can be experimenting with your customers or um, with your organization before you go broader. Um, to make sure that it's something that can uh, be applied effectively when you go live. Matt, back to you. All right. I did want to pause here just for a moment to answer a question um, uh, in, the, uh, in the questions. And um, apologies for not seeing this sooner. Um, the question is, how do you see something like OKR is trying parts of the business to the tying tying parts of the business to the overall strategy. In an ideal world, your corporate strategy sits like a mobile from which uh, functional strategies, business unit strategies hang. So the notion of strategic speed um, is much like geese flying in a V, or if you're familiar with cycling, um, the Peloton, where they draft off each other so that you can go 40% faster, farther with uh, less energy. In Formula One, there is a drag reduction wing in the back, only certain zones um, on the racetrack. You're allowed to use that uh, because the air resistance uh, allows you to pass your competitor. Um, OKRs are the preferred deployment method. So once you have de designed strategy at the corporate level, you then design it in, in an aligned way at the functional level. And you use sort of a, a vertical, horizontal, vertical backup so that everything hangs together. And then OKRs are done the same way. So OKRs uh, begin with understanding the strategic priorities that are tied to your strategy. And then you think quarterly, what are the things that I need to do from an objective standpoint, from a key result standpoint um, to get traction and deploy my strategy? So thank you for, uh, thank you for that question. Yeah, there was another one, Matt, that came in. Um, what percent of SM budget do you see allocated to experimentation? So great question. I don't think that you actually allocate specific would allocate specific dollars to experimentation. You could, right, and say, hey, we're gonna have an innovation team focused on this. I think as it relates to SM, what we're saying is rather than launching something and going broad, uh phase it out and test it to make sure that when you go broad, you're getting maximum value and results and the highest value of ROI, especially in the current environment, right? Given the headwinds that we're facing in the economy, um, better to test um, and experiment before making broad changes, which may have um, potentially negative ramifications on the business, right? You wanna get as much momentum as you can. Um, so that testing perspective is super critical. Matt? 
Yeah, and I would just add to that, um, as you'll see when we get into some of the, the following principles, um, when we run experiments, let's, let's say, for example, we're trying to improve a process, um, sort of the going in proposition really is that the people coming up with um, a solution that can be experimented with are the people actually doing the experiment. So it's not a budgeted, other than allowing time to experiment, it's not like a budgeted sort of thing. Um, in the lean, traditional lean world, um, they actually change the notion of work itself. So the the, the work is not to do a specific job as it's written on a piece of paper, but it's to constantly improve the work. You know your role, you know the cycle that you're working in, the process you're working in. Um, you can constantly, being ex uh, constantly be experimenting with the way that you do work. And it's something that actually comes natural. Golfers, you know, that might be, uh, you know, viewing this, aren't you constantly on the golf tee, just kind of tweaking your swing, trying to get a little extra distance, a little bit more straighter down the freeway with just making little changes. And that's really what we're talking about. And we'd also be remiss, I think, Pablo, if we didn't mention the fact that we do invest in a couple of uh, companies that offer experimentation as a service, as a platform. Yep. Absolutely. Cool. Uh, the A. In, in scale, accelerated value. Um, one way to think about accelerated value is the interplay between two constantly moving gears, value defined and value delivered. Um, one of our colleagues um, on our team, uh, I'll call her out, uh, Sama Hafiz, uh, wrote a great article and contributed to uh, the chapter in the book on accelerated value. And it was called Mind the Gap. And I don't know if you've ever, you know, traveled the tube in London, but they're constantly reminding you to mind the gap. Um, we're talking about here a value gap. And it is part and parcel to why something like time to value isn't always optimal from the customer's perspective. So what do we mean by value in the first place? There is uh, the notion of a job to be done. Matt Garman, who is the senior vice president, I think he's still senior vice president of sales and marketing at Amazon Web Services says, uh, and I love this quote, um, the biggest obstacle to growth is the failure to understand and align with customer desired business outcomes. And it really hardly ever fails when we begin looking at how a company thinks about value in terms of the products that are delivered, that they don't really understand the job that a given customer is trying to get done. And so to tease that concept out, I just want to share with you a story. And I don't know if you're familiar with the story of ICE, but I'll take you back um, before the turn of the, of the 20th century to the late 1900s. And the way that people would get ice back then, I don't know if you're aware of this, but um, you'd basically have to wait to the wintertime um, to a frozen lake, hopefully live near a frozen lake or a pond, where uh, the local boys would go out with a big saw, like you see here, cut big chunks of ice, slap them on a horse-drawn cart, and deliver them to your house for a fee. That went on for decades. Uh, late... 1919, 20, 1920, something like that, the notion of uh, ice factories came into being, right? Now you didn't have to wait for wintertime. Doesn't matter where you live. You could get ice all year round. Um, another 20 years passed and something called a refrigerator was introduced. So ice 1.0, uh, cut the ice, ice 2.0, get your ice delivered because of the factory can deliver it. Ice 3.0, don't need any of those. I can do it in my house. Here's the interesting fact, as you see here, none of the harvesters became ice factories. None of the ice factories um, made the leap, made the jump of the curve to become refrigerator companies. And the reason for that is they weren't looking at their operation and their business from the customer's point of view, because the customer's job to be done here was how to keep my perishables fresher longer. It wasn't how do I get ice? Once you understand the true value of the customer's job to be done and the fact that that job is stable over time, irrespective of your solution, because they will find other options if your solution isn't working, then you're on to something. Then you can close the gap. The way that we do this practically, and again, we'll share these resources with you, is that we do something called customer value mapping. We map out the, the jobs to be done, and then we map out all of the touch points looking for 
the value gap. We are gap hunters. And then we think about what are the processes behind those gaps and what are our opportunities to improve that and close those gears down to remove the friction because that is the target of accelerated value. Just a few quick checkpoints. Yeah, and I love this, especially as we think about um, customers, right? So how well, does your, how well does your solution help customers achieve their desired business outcomes? Do you have a documented view of what your customer personas truly value? And do you believe your customers realize the value of your solution in the time they should, right? Part of the reason we use this framework is, and I know a lot of you probably look at like, well, what who is my ideal customer profile, right? An ICP. And what are the personas that we are targeting as a business to sell to? And do I understand those personas? For example, you might be selling to a CTO, a chief technical officer. You might be selling to the head of HR, a chief revenue officer, a chief marketing officer, um, somebody in cyber. You might be talking to the security officer. So understanding what those customers value, right, actually helps you and your team target them more effectively and also sell to them. So Something we recommend highly is really documenting um, those personas and understanding what journey those customers are on to make sure that you're speaking to them effectively um, as you are positioning your solution to them. So just some things to keep in mind. Let's go to the next principle, um, which is really focused on lean process. And this is where I love that we are taking the elements of what was you know, really focused more on product and turning it on its head to focus it on, you know, the marketing and sales, uh, you know, the, the, the go-to-market element. So in its essence, um, when a customer comes in as a lead, they raise their hand, maybe we reached out to them, and then they follow the continuum, right? We know it's not a, a straight line, but they follow the continuum of, you know, the marketing process, the sales process, um, you know, we close the opportunity, now it becomes, you know, implementation, um, you know, we get paid and the customer starts using that process. So the, the lead to the lead to cash process, order to cash process, if you will, this is strife, um, with opportunity for optimization, right? As you scale a company, whether, you know, you're at 10 million or hundred million or 20 billion, every stage of growth adds additional complexity in the process in systems, et cetera that ultimately adds significant amount of um, waste, right? So as we think about uh, the value that a customer gets in terms of the work they do, Matt, next slide. Um, the value added work that you provide that your solution solves for a customer, that is really all a customer really is willing to pay for, right? That is what they signed up for is value added work. And you can see here that there is a lot of non-value added work. There are things that sometimes have to get done there are um, regulations, there's policies that have to get followed, et cetera, that are part of providing the value at work that you can't necessarily always eliminate. So the amount of non-value at work you have um, definitely should be limited, but you're never gonna have none. Then there is waste, right? Which you can see some of the elements over here, which could be overproduction, overprocessing, conveyance, inventory, motion, waiting, and defects, right? We work redoing contracts. Inventory in the business world could be technical debt that we have either on the product or it could be go to market debt that we have just based on how we've structured organizations, teams, et cetera. And sticking to our um, story on F1, right? Uh, the F1 teams have really focused on removing a lot of that waste from a motion perspective and waiting perspective. And before we go into this, if you've got a pen on your desk, if, uh, or if you don't, try and find one real quick. I would ask for you to not pick it up yet, but I've got a pen here. So if it's on your desk, see how quickly you can pick up that pen and write a capital letter A on a piece of paper. Right, I'll give you guys a couple of seconds here. Took me about 2.7 seconds. Um, did it again, maybe 2.4 seconds. Couldn't get my clicker on the third time, and it took me about three and a half seconds. So pretty fast, right? I'm sure you guys are coming up with similar times. If you're taking more than five seconds, uh, maybe you got an issue with your pen. But we wanted to show you a real life example of the efficiencies um, that the F1 teams have done, again, through having a very clear strategy, doing constant experimentation, focusing on driving a lot of value, and ultimately removing as much waste in the system. So we're going to show you the video on the left is 
how things used to be done, uh, and then where teams are today. All right, so again, it took me two and a half, 2.7 seconds to pick up a pen and write a capital letter A, and I was trying to go as fast as possible. That last pit stop that you see there was done in 1.8 seconds, which is crazy if you think about that four tires came off of the car, four new tires were put on the car, and the car took off in less than two seconds. Um, if you happen to write a capital letter A in less than two seconds, Again, pretty simple task compared to changing four tires. But again, wanted to stress the just the absolute um, ability that you have to streamline your process internally. So, so how do we do that? So similar to what Matt shared before on some of the frameworks on strategy, et cetera, we use Lean Kaizen Sprints um, when we're working with teams. And some of you all may be familiar with Lean. You may be familiar with Six Sigma. This is diff a little different than Six Sigma. But basically what you're doing here is leveraging your internal teams cross-functionally, right? You got people from different departments who are actually doing the job. They understand also, Matt, to Matt's point on um, accelerating value, they understand that jobs need to be done by a customer, right? They understand the jobs that we are doing internally as a business. And we basically map out the existing process, right? If we focus on order to cashier. Next step would be those teams then map out, now that I've observed the waste that we have in the system, and again, that waste could be unnecessary touch points from different departments. Why is legal sending the contract back and forth 10 times to the customer? Why um, do we redline something? Why does why are we using five different systems? Those same teams that mapped out the existing process then map out what is the ideal process that we want to build. Um, and then in the spirit of a constant experimentation, take that recommendation to executives and then test it before actually implementing it. And we've done this over 40 times with our portfolio companies. Again, Matt and I have done this in a public company and in a startup. On average, we are reducing waste in order to cash by 25%. So think about the impact that has on time to value for the customer being able to use the solution that you provided and sold them on more quickly, but also time to revenue, right? The amount of time that you can decrease to get revenue for your business. So again, given the environment that we're in today, this is actually one of the more powerful tools that you have at your disposal to really evaluate given I might have limited resources, limited budget um, to spend on things to optimize, looking at what I have, how do I begin, become more efficient? So let's take away um, some of the key sort of checkpoints for you all to think of as you are thinking about how to potentially leverage this. So one is eliminating waste um, a priority, right? Um, for you and the organization. And again, eliminating waste is not a corporate initiative, right? People should be empowered to think, hey, I'm not necessarily being efficient in my job. Um, I need to be more effective. And remember, efficiency is about doing work right. Effectiveness is about doing the right work. And so our, our focus here is about being effective, not necessarily only being efficient. You can be very efficient at going 0-16 as a football team, not necessarily effective. Um, second point to think about, are your key processes optimized for quality, cost, speed, and customer experience? Again, we might be optimizing internally, but ultimately it's also ensuring that the customer is getting maximum value and that we haven't disrupted their engagement with us as a, as a company. And third, do you have constantly updated standard operate, operating procedures for all processes, right? Does product know what they need to do? Marketing know what they need to do? Engineering, sales, customer success, uh, legal, HR. Remember an organization is a living organism and an ecosystem that needs to all work effectively uh, to maximize the value for um, a customer. I see a lot of questions coming in. Matt, do you want to tee those up? Yeah, um, this is a good point to, to answer one that just came in um, because one of the things we do, because it relates to the customer value map. And the question is, um, who owns the customer value map, the CCO or the CRO? What are the RACI roles pre and post sales for data capture based on that ownership? So that's a good question because um, when we do the customer value mapping, oftentimes when we look at the internal processes, that will point us toward a process that needs to be optimized in the way that uh, uh, Pablo just mentioned. So um, 
I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at who owns this. It depends on the organization. And in, in our work, sometimes it is the CCO, sometimes it is the CRO. More often, the CRO is focused on what Pablo just uh, shared about lean process because we're sort of coming at um, time to value and time to revenue directly often. And more on the customer value uh, mapping side, it is the CCO that kind of owns that um, as an initiative. And we we try and do, you know, by, by customer persona. So we will have a map for every key customer persona and that acts as a prioritized list of actions to close those value gaps. In terms of the lean process, um, oftentimes it is the CRO and we'll have cross-functional teams, go-to-market teams, um, usually we'll segment sales um, from you know, post sales and have teams dedicated uh, that way to improve those. Just a quick note though too, um, just to close the, the loop and connect the dot on the CC Meyer story, the way that they were actually able to go from 66 days to 74 really um, was based on some of the things that Pablo just mentioned around the, the Formula One pit stop. If you think about that pit stop, it is non-value added, all of it. Anytime you take the racer off the track, salesperson out of uh, you know the act of selling, that's uh, non-value added work. So what do you try and do? You try and shrink it. Now it's become so entertaining that it's actually value added for the audience. Um, but um, on the CC Meyer story, they took the waiting out of the game. So typically when you have a construction project, you build something to code the way that you think it should be built. You have to schedule the inspector to come out, could take weeks. Inspector comes out, says, nah, you got to fix that. Now nah, you got to wait another two weeks, schedule. So they took all of the waiting and the motion involved in getting an inspector there and demanded that as part of the contract, um, that inspector had to be there around the clock, 24-7, real time, as they were working to inspect uh, or disapprove of the work that was done. And that really is the key to moving from 140 days to 66. It's the key to moving from one minute pit stops down to under uh, a couple of seconds. So any other questions on those before we move into the final? Yeah, there was one more. Um, value frameworks are nice. How do you account for timing and sense of urgency? One of the biggest blockers to sales and marketing motion is to do nothing. And this is an acute problem in down markets. Absolutely, right? I think this is where um, the, the notion of constant experimentation actually plays in your favor, right? So sometimes do nothing is the answer because too expensive, might be too disruptive, uh, don't have time to really formulate the strategy. So working in more tiger teams, coming up with like, hey, let's test this hypothesis uh, and not maybe all down market, um, but a part of the down market. Again, leveraging that principle of like locking on your strategy, test it first um, and iterating on it before you go broader might be a way to break down that barrier of doing nothing. May not always work depending on the leadership team. Um, but love that question because it actually dovetails nicely uh, into um, the last uh, framework, which I actually think is uh, personally the most important, um, which is uh, the E in um, in the framework. So let's go to the next slide, Matt, or sorry, go ahead. That's right. Before we do that, um, another question just came in. Can the lean process be applied to uh, lead to order process where the delays in many cases are dependent on external factors. Um, I'll take that. The, the, the short answer is yes, sometimes it depends on the external factors, but for example, many times we've had a situation where we're trying to improve the uh, you know, order to cash process and um, the external factor happens to be a partner, channel partner, uh, perhaps we will have that external factor um, in the room to help us. Um, in, one, in one instance, we, uh, we took the implementation time from one of our portfolio companies, um, we cut it almost 60%, um, and it really was about that external factor uh, by and large. And when you involve that external factor in the solution, now you have control over the solution. So it's not always 100% of the time that we we can do that, but when we have the opportunity and the external factor is something that we can involve in the process, um, we can really move uh, move forward a lot faster. So thank you for that question. Cool. Let's go to the last element, um, which is really uh, esprit de corps, um, which really uh, in French stands for team spirit. So this is a picture of my grandfather um, who survived fighting World War II, uh, landed after the Normandy uh, invasion a day or two later, spent about 
two and a half months crossing across Germany. Um, behind me, you can see uh, if you're if you're watching the video, um, those are his World War II medals. Um, he was awarded a medal for bravery, a double bronze star for being one of the first soldiers to cross the bridge at Remagen. Um, sharing this one because uh, the notion of leadership and esprit de corps really has found its way um, in military and paramilitary uh, units across the world who are notorious for building strong leadership teams and holding their teams accountable. Um, and the, the motto mission first people always is one that um, I've always espoused to. It's one that's the, the military um, and a guy I used to work with um, years ago uh, always sort of uh, stated. And so when you think about the elements that we've been talking about and a couple of your questions, you know, have been around, you know, the one we just answered now on, you know, do nothing attitude or, you know, who owns, you know, who owns the, the customer value map, et cetera. The reason why, Matt, if you go to the next slide, we have Esprit de Corps sort of in the center is because uh, it's the glue that keeps everything together, right? If you think about how a company works and not to, you know, dumb this down to make it easy, but without the right leadership team who is supporting their people, who is developing their individuals, um, who is empowering them to be innovative, right? Who is challenging their strategy um, from the prior year, uh, who's also listening to the team, right? Spending time with those people on the ground uh, to get feedback on what's actually working, what's not working. The elements that we've gone through really will not work, right? So for those of you that are leaders in organizations, um, you have that um, power, right? Um, if, for those of you that are CEOs or co-founders as well, like you are driving this culture, right? And culture is everything in a company without um, without any of that culture or leadership, basically nothing will work, right? So um, our ask to you is the other four principles are phenomenal, but getting the organization aligned, again, to Matt's original point on strategy, having OKRs or objectives that the company understands the direction um, and getting, getting everybody aligned to that will make things easier. So things to think about from a checkpoint perspective, um, do you have a strong people culture fit? Um, do you have trustful relationships, right? So do leaders across teams actually work together effectively? And we know we're all humans, we all have egos. There's always tension between sales and marketing or sales and product, product and engineering, product and marketing. So uh, your job as leaders is to help break down those barriers and leverage these principles to help you grow uh, sustainably, especially given the current environment that we're in. Um, and third, you know, obviously as leadership of the ilk that can carry the company into the future, do you have the right leaders? Are you thinking effectively um, and innovatively? So we're coming to the end of our session. Um, just to reiterate, uh, these are the five principles that we talked about um, that you can learn more about uh, in the book that we'll give away shortly. And I think based on the number of people on the call, everybody will get a free copy. Um, but again, focus on strategic speed, constant experimentation, accelerated value, lean process, and esprit de corps, easier to, 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 to memorize using the moniker scale. Um, and we wanted to leave you with one final quote that really captures uh, the essence of lean as you think about how you can transform uh, your business going forward. So thank you all very much for joining us. Um, our ask, as we, as we give you back a little bit of time here on the next slide, um, you can fill out the form, I think, um, Deanna is going to provide that form in the, the chat for all of you. Uh, fill out the form, get a free book in a couple of weeks from Matt and I. And also we're nominated for a session at TechCrunch in Boston in a couple of months. If you've got time to upvote uh, our session, would greatly appreciate it. If you didn't like our session, that's okay. Vote for somebody else who's also trying to present at TechCrunch, but uh, would appreciate uh, anybody's uh, feedback and positivity. So it takes two minutes to sign up for a book. Thank you all very much. Hopefully these principles can help you and your teams more effectively weather the storm that we have today, but also during a boom, continue to scale your teams. Thank you.